I, I do have, I have to have some concerns, uh, I do have some sympathies, and it, because we face it everywhere. We don't face it in Fabrics, we face it in all places on Sheffield as well. And it is a problem. I mean, I've, like the South, I've, I've been in business all my life, pretty well. I had involvement in retail. My wife, until two years ago, had um, three retail shops, um, two of them in Sheerness, uh, High Street. Uh, no longer, she's, she's out of the business now. She's out of the business for one reason, really. And that was um, because Tesco's in kept increasing the range of the types of uh, products it was offering. She simply couldn't compete anymore. But the problem is that the problem isn't Tesco's. This is, this is the problem. The problem isn't Tesco's. The problem isn't these supermarkets. It's us. It, and this is what we, we say, but if you use them, and, and it's very difficult for us to complain, no, when we go to, where do you do your shopping? I disagree with you there because but, I've got no problem with Tesco's increasing their range and increasing their range and increasing their range in a focal area. I'm not talking, talk, forget about the establishment, in a focal yeah. area where everyone's got the choice to walk into that area and do it. When they allow someone on the outskirts, on the outskirts to go and do it. Now, when you put the Sabre Centre up, <coughs> for example, that's fine because you're creating a shopping centre where there is the opportunity for people to take units within that, that shopping centre. When you create one mm. shop, Big shot on the yeah. outskirts, it just drags everything yeah, but, but, out. I just think that's wrong. Well, let me tell you, I mean, you you're wrong about that, I'm sorry. Okay. Opening Sabre Centre, opening the Sabre Centre, destroyed Gillingham High Street. It, it wiped it out effectively. You go to Gillingham High Street now, and apart from one or two shops, I mean, it's, 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 it really is run down in exactly the same way. The Blue Water <coughs> has destroyed Dartford yeah. High Street. It does, you know, it, 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 out of town. Shopping centres do that, uh, and I think we have a role to play in government to try and discourage that through planning. And there's, this is the problem with planning, and, and there is a, a, a dilemma that we have. The government is introducing a localism bill, and it's going through Parliament at the moment. It's a huge, I mean, you know, when I saw this bill, literally it's that thick, and it was, it's a very really daunting bill. It, the, 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 the thrust of it is to our lo local planning, so local people will decide. So, Fabsham, people in Fabsham, or even smaller, down into little villages, will be able to put together uh, local planning partnerships if they want to, to put up a local plan. Uh, and, and that's great, because that means local people will decide. So local people will decide whether they want a, a supermarket on the outskirts of Fabsham. Local people will decide whether they want a Morrison's on the outside of Sheerness, or whether it's better, as is going to happen, there's going to be a Morrison's in the centre of Senegal. Yeah, and that's fine, because you're right, I'm a great believer, let's get it in the centre of the town, because it drags people into the town. But it'd be for local people to decide. And that's great, in theory. The problem then arises, <coughs> is how you then have a strategic view of planning. And that then becomes difficult, because, you know, we always have this dilemma, I have this dilemma. And we're in, a, we're in an area here, in which we have a dilemma. That's the Kent Science part. Because I believe, fundamentally, that we need more businesses. We need to increase the amount of employment we've got in the area. And the only way we do that is by expansion. But of course, all the, all the communities around the Kent Science part don't want to see an expansion because it's disrupting their lives, the traffic can't become worse. So you've got to get that balance. If you leave it to local decisions, real local decisions, you'll never get anywhere. And so I've got a bit of a dilemma as to whether localism is good or whether we have to just um, have an element of localism but still have a strategic view. But uh, I, I do agree and, and I'm aware of it and I, I, wish, I can assure you the government's aware of the problem. You, you won't hear me disagree and I've, I've, I've campaigned for ages to uh, Swell Borough Council to take, for instance, to take a, a more lenient view of, of, of parking, and you know you find that um, they will, their argument will be, um, well, if we give free parking, people will use that free parking to communities will use it, it will be filled up. What you want to try and do is encourage uh, shops. They can't seem to, they can't seem to be able to work a system. I could do it for them, and you could do it for them. Work a system whereby shoppers can go in and shop for two hours and get free parking for two hours, and then don't have to pay. But I, I agree with you. Uh, one of the uh, 
things in the Locals Bill <coughs> is it will allow <coughs> local authorities to offer rain relief mm. in certain circumstances. <coughs> Uh, and we had um, some time ago, and uh, John, my office manager, will probably back me out. There was a scheme some time ago where local authorities had a, 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 a discretionary uh, a, a, a opportunity to offer discretionary rate relief to, to certain businesses, particularly in rural areas, to try and to try and save the last village post office, the latest, last village shop. I think that was that's now to be discontinued. But I think local and big, localism bill will reintroduce that. So yeah. there will be a measure in the localism bill to actually allow local authorities more scope to do that. But of course, even you know, let's be honest, local authorities are only a bit like the government. The government hasn't got any money. Yeah. Local authorities haven't got any money. All the money they use is our money. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and you, you've got to balance whether we want to pay more in rates or more in council tax or more in general taxation to allow these these authorities to use our money to help shops. I mean, it, it is a very difficult balancing act for local authorities. <laughs> You're right, it's that it's the, you cannot, small shopkeepers cannot compete on price. But where they do have an advantage is they can compete on service. And the one thing I know, as a, as a consumer rather than as a retailer, is I would far sooner go to a shop where I could say, um, can you give me some advice on that? What's, you know, what am I going to get from that? And have somebody there, A, who wants to serve me and actually is knowledgeable enough to give me the information rather than going into a supermarket and they just, you ask them a question and they look at you as though you, know, you ask them whether they fly to the moon. And then that's, so there is a role to play. And I'd like to see more diversity in our, in our high streets, more independence, so that we can actually encourage people to come in, because increasingly um, you will find that people will want to, will turn their backs, I think, on supermarkets, because, you know, supermarkets is great for cheap uh, groceries and things, because you, we all know what a tin of baked beans looks like, we all know how to open a tin of baked beans, you don't trust, but if someone wants to buy a specialist piece of equipment, they want to go to a specialist shop, and I think we need a few more specialist shops. Yeah, I think, I think actually, I'm pretty sure it's the, the issue of fighters, because actually, its closure, in many ways, to me, was a positive story. Right? And I, I know that's horrible to say, because we don't want to see any closure. And I'm, and I'm not talking about it being positive for the closure point of view, but it was the, it was the, it was the reaction that I found was very, very refreshing. If that company had closed anywhere else in the country, there have been all woes and gloom and doom. I listened to people on the radio who were actually being interviewed about the closure. And they all were always said exactly the same, oh, we said it's going to close, but we'll move on. You know, we'll, we'll find a way. We'll use this site. We'll actually, we are, we are, one of our traits down here is we are far more positive. We have a far more, a far greater entrepreneurial spirit. We will get on. We will make things happen. And the thing about, and I don't want to talk about Kent. That's for Kent. Kent. Councillors, in which we've got one here today, to worry about. Okay. My passion, my whole focus, and that's why I was saying earlier that I can't talk about Fabian. My focus is on sitting down and shepherding and doing the very best I can for my people here and my businesses here. And so I want to be fixated. And I think we've got a story to tell. We can be at the forefront and we can be the dynamo for Ken here in this area. is to make it easier, uh, make it conditional for small companies, small businesses in my area, to actually get a bid for national and local government contracts, which are so difficult at the moment for you to get into. So that's what we, we'll come to that in a minute. Um, but what I do think we can do, we can do it locally. We can ourselves, in, I can do it by going around, which I did, I was, I was last week uh, visiting uh, Morrison's and uh, locally, and I was, you know, suggesting gently that uh, they might try and source more. The Morrisons are actually very good. I don't want, I don't want to take sides on, on the supermarket battle, but I have to say I have a lot of respect for Morrisons because the one thing they do do is they do source the vast majority of their produce, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, meat or, or fruit and vegetables, 
from British sources. And I, you know, I, so I think that's very good. And that's one step. If we can encourage more of them to produce locally, <coughs> that, that, would be, that would be very, very helpful. So we can do it. And part of something else we're going to come to a bit later when I launch my website, part of the website's going to be um, we're going to encourage large, larger companies uh, to actually uh, advertise on there jobs or services they want to buy so that local, small local businesses will be able to go on and bid for those jobs. So we can do it ourselves. I've already uh, written to uh, ministers asking whether they will change the rules um, <coughs> to uh, revert them to where uh, landlords were, were received uh, uh, housing benefits on behalf of their clients because I've explained that you know whilst a proportion of tenants uh, are responsible enough to <coughs> send the money over to their landlord, too, too many of them actually don't do that mm -hmm. uh, and also it, it means if, if a tenant can reach the end of his tenancy uh, and then clear off with uh, leaving a debt uh, which the uh, the, the uh, landlord is unable to recover. I said, so you know, and I had written to them. I have to say the response I got back was a typical bureaucratic response <coughs> hoping it was left over from the previous administration we were going to actually move forward. Uh, and that was that, uh, no, they're not intended to change the rules at the moment. However, this was the thing on it, however, they are reviewing it to see whether they can do something in the future. Uh, I, I, will, I want to take it a bit further and uh, I, I'm going back to them and saying, yeah, thanks for your response. However, is there then any way we can make the rules easier to obtain permission of tenants that their landlords should receive the money? So I'm working on it. We've got to try and increase the number of homes that are available, that are affordable homes, um, for people to rent. That's what we do. The only way we'll do that in the long term is by encouraging people like yourself to invest in those homes and provide that, those because other people can't provide them by very nature because if they could provide them they'd have their own home. So we recognise that. Yeah, all I'm saying is that it will take time to get that. We've got, we've got to change lots of things to get into that position. I mean, we, we're changing, uh, as you know, we're changing the, the, the housing benefit rules because we've got to try and get rid of some of the abuses in the system. And I'm sure that you are not your company is not one of those that, uh, that, uh, that uh, is abusing the system, but we've got to, business, it doesn't have no, to but we've got to, we've got to, so we're trying to change that because we recognise we've got to do something to provide the, the flow of the, the flow of housing, and we will try and do something. And I promise you personally, I'm trying to get as much done as I can. I mean, I made a speech last week in Parliament, which I and I put forward a suggestion that would allow open up of more development land outside of the Green Belt. And that was by uh, suggesting that we should uh, classify as brownfield sites um, home parks and caravan sites. Because, you know, in our area, we have a massive, uh, massive uh, uh, over uh, uh, supply of caravan sites. I mean, you know, we've got something like um, 7,000, 7,500 holiday homes in our area. And we actually need about three and a half to four thousand. So that means that we've got three thousand holiday homes, whether that's mobile homes or whether that's chalet standing out there, that are not being used. And I said, well, if we classic, and if and if the if the site owner wanted to close that site down, it has to revert to a rural status, which means you can't develop on it. And that seems to be totally dark. So what I've suggested is make classify them as brown field sites and let the owners develop them into low affordable housing. It, it could be done. It would solve that problem almost overnight. <coughs> uh, and the government is saying, the response from ministers was, oh yeah, but you don't, we don't have to do that because under the localism bill, we're going to allow local authorities to determine where the development. And that then worries me, because I know the view as well of our council planning officers is that it will be over their dead body that they actually allow these sites to be you, for, be developed, and that's where I, we, I have this problem with the localism. Bill. I think there is a genuine understanding in government that it is small businesses that we've got to turn to 
to actually generate the jobs we need for the future. And when you look at um, the, uh, I mean, take the recent announcement about the increase in bank lending amount, right? Um, the banks have agreed to lend an additional 11 billion pound this year. That's what's been agreed. 10 billion pound, 10 billion pound has been earmarked for small business because we rec the government recognises that that's where the growth is going to have to be. So I think there's a recognition. Now, how we, how we actually uh, achieve that is, is going to be more problematic because it's... it's we, I, don't think it's too, I don't think it's about money. I don't think it's about money. I think it's about loosening the yokes of bureaucracy that's been around your neck for too long. That's what, and once again, the government recognises that. And it's all, as you, you may or may not know, it's undertaken at the moment a consultation exercise to try and change the employment laws to uh, allow, for instance, and that's only a small thing I know, but I think it's a very important thing, to, 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 uh, to increase the period when you can have somebody employed for you before they can go to a, a, a tribunal from one year to two years, which I think is a very important move because doubling that, that trial period is very important. And also, um, uh, changing the whole system of tribunals so that you will be able to dismiss uh, and get rid of people quicker and easier because that's another, uh, and at less cost, which is more important. And I think uh, there are other, thing, other areas within employment uh, regulations that we're, we're looking to do. We're also looking, and we've already introduced, a one... Um, one um, bill in, one bill out. So we, we're only introducing uh, uh, legislation relating to business if we get rid of another one. So, and, and these are these are our areas. It, but I'm going to keep repeating this whenever we have these meetings over <laughs> over there. And that is, it takes time to do these things. You know, we've had, and I'm not just talking about the last government. I think over the last couple of decades, we've had a. a, a uh, slow deterioration and, and, and in the balance between uh, business and uh, private sector business and public sector business. And we've got to rebalance that and it takes an awful long time to get that balance right. One of the problems we face, and what any government faces is this, is what's going to a dilemma. The reason the country is in the financial mess it is, is because of the banking collapse. The banking collapse was caused by toxic debts. The toxic debts were caused by banks going out and lending to people who they should never have lent to in the first place. That's the problem. We don't want to get into that cycle again. So the banks who <coughs> say, yeah, we have got money to lend, we're happy to lend the money, but we're not just going to lend it to anybody that actually says, you've got to give me a loan. They are going to look at the, the background. They're going to look at where they've got the experience. They're going to look to see whether they've had a stream of companies that have gone into liquidation. And they're not going to lend them that money. And I wouldn't lend them money. You know, and I think that's the problem. We've built up a perception out there among some people that banks should lend you. You know, I want a loan, so I've got to get a loan. And we don't want that. We want banks to lend to people who've got a proper business plan, who've got uh, uh, some collateral if necessary, and are actually able to prove that they can run a business. They won't give them the money if it's gonna, they're going to go to default in, in 24 months' time. So that's one of the problems we face, that dilemma. How are we going to help uh, uh, small businesses expand without getting back to toxic debt? That's, that's a, it's a big problem. I don't think you want to hear my views on the local enterprise partnership. So, because we've got them. You've got them. I mean, but look, uh, that, what can they do? Uh, what can they do that we ourselves can't do? Because local, the local enterprise, a local enterprise partnership that's covering King, Essex, and East Sussex <coughs> is going to have all sorts of conflicting product uh, pressures on it. You know, I want to. I want to attract investment to this area. Why would I want to help them take it to Colchester or Crawley or whatever? I mean, it's just, I, I can't, it's going to be a talking job. And my big fear is that local enterprise partnerships are just eventually going to become the same as the development agencies. It will be seen under a different name if we're not careful. What I want to see is I want to see the government bring, it, bring them to heel, properly control them, 
and make sure they do what they're set out to do, which is purely and simply to uh, direct the money from government to the people that actually need it, because that's what it's supposed to be there for. But I, I, I have to say, I'm pretty cynical about it.